freedom to believe we have our beliefs and do it so freely and we need to have the legal base the legal uh, uh, to help if we don't have this legal base to help or to sustain with for sure it means a dictatorship uh, social cultural because it will show that we believe but not really and when we have a legal uh, um, helping and and give as 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 a as a foundation then it works this is why this principle is very important so uh, freedom of religion without um, the legal system to support it is um, uh, when the, we uh, when we love the human behavior and we love human beings we respect and we show because sometimes we talk too much about freedom of religion there's too many theories in brazil we don't have uh, too many books but we if we go worldwide there's uh, theories many theories about religion freedom that in practice in the real in reality they do not show uh, this uh, genuine love and becomes only a dream so the practice is the demonstration of love another principle of our parliamental front is it, it so it com it fights against uh, hate and uh, promotes love and this shows our love it it shows respect uh, to our neighbors and and uh, religion, freedom of religion uh, diminish uh, violence and promotes peace. This is why in Brazil, when we have a lot of violence, we see religion and the respect of religion enter in these places. The culture of peace starts to manifest, to become more, more uh, people can see much more uh, and, and the change of behavior and to be a, a president of this uh, front, of um, this parliamental front, because this parliament uh, uh, teaches uh, the, the, the principles that I learned since a young man about the Articles of Faith, that we respect our religion and the rights that they have to worship God in whatever way and form they want. I'm happy to be elected to this uh, position, and I'm happy to be able to bring here this, those thoughts in this symposium and uh, to share with you um, what we do in our parliamental front and the con Brazilian con National Brazilian Congress. So thank you very much, and I'll be uh, available to your questions. We are grateful for Moranya Torgan. Now we will listen from Hugo Oliveira, and we would like to have the microphone placed. And I, I, rem I remember, I reminded to, that we will have some time afterwards for questions and answers, and we invite you all to take note of your ideas so that after uh, we close uh, the speeches, we can open the floor for questions and answers. Is it working? Yes, it is. Good morning to all. As said before, my name is Hugo Oliveira. I'm uh, an attorney from the National Bishops Association of Brazil that gathers all the congregations established in, the, in Brazil, about 600 organizations, and also the uh, Catholic National Association of Brazil that also gathers uh, 
1250 organizations, Catholic organizations in Brazil, and I'm sincerely here thankful to the invitation that was extended to me, and I are, I'm feel obligated uh, to say that everything I'm going to expose now comes from my personal opinion and not coming from the organization which I represent. I believe that is uh, common sense, and I support myself on what uh, Deputy Morani Torgan said, that Brazil is a country th that brings us a reality that is a little dissonant to what happens in the rest of the world. The process of secularism that we uh, observe in many other places, it's not seen in Brazil like that. On the contrary, Brazil is a place where the, uh, the, the, the people identity is totally associated around the religious values. Obviously, it has to do with uh, our beginnings, our colonization that was predominantly Catholic, but also that has been strengthened with other peoples, other cultures, and many other uh, religious denominations that formed our culture. So Brazil has not lost it in its culture. Uh, on the, uh, it actually has been reinforced. But however, religion sometimes is seen as an obstacle. And, and this was never noticed, seen before. So for the for the society, uh, religion was seen as an opportunity in the past um, based on the fact that all religious denominations, and I will not uh, cite any one of them here, uh, were the, these religions were the responsible parties for uh, the first schools, the first uh, hospitals that was uh, brought to the country. Now religion is seen as, as an obstacle because of a wrong vision of and 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 its aim is it, its ref, it reference. M it comes from conservative groups. These conservative groups have an opposition to some initiatives that I would say are totally minority, but that end up uh, gaining a lot of momentum and voice in the media. Uh, all of you have received here a s um, serious uh, criticism to some sects that we have in Brazil which origin that I will uh, express a little more in, in my opinion, have contributed to this opposition from the people. E, so if we're talking here about social stability, we have a concrete, a solid reason to say that this is being threatened. So it's us against them that we listen a lot in Brazil and, and refers to the the haves against the the, the have-nots and in the conservatives uh, against um, progresses progresses and these two completely antagonic visions threaten the democracy. Are we protecting the minorities or do we protect the majorities? We shouldn't have that or in between. Democracy is the most applicable uh, way to promote both, uh, protect the minority and promote the interests of the majorities. So this brought to us uh, a dormant agenda. These cultural issues were kind of dormant in the country. Recently, we had an agenda turned to uh, political and economical problems. And now we have these other elements added to the conversation. And it's interesting that the media has uh, labeled this discussion as a big waste of time. So th those public uh, opinion talk about this and say, this is nonsense. Why are we wasting our time about uh, freedom of religion or marriage between same sex? And this shouldn't even be part of our agenda, which is wrong because obviously this has to be part of our discussions in our society. So there's a big label that is put, the label on religious conservative against those who are progressive, which is a big mistake. 
as if the secularism was a progressive and religion was only conservative. One history shows that in many, many instances, they actually um, are one with the other. I like to this. I think there's a lot of negativity saying what the, that the, talking about what the state cannot uh, oppose, or the, the state cannot uh, establish is, and the laicism is not correct. The like state doesn't impose. It it comes from a, a social contract amongst its people. And if I can say something here about the Catholic Church, it, the Catholic Church has, this, has it in its constitution for centuries. So this pluralism, religious pluralism, cultural, all this tolerance, all this freedom is part of our constitution in a very clear manner. Article 19, although it says that Brazil cannot impose any type of religions, in its last words, it uh, reinforces the covenants of the public interest. This is very solid. I'd like to give you some numbers. 45% of our system is uh, given to um, religious institutions. 85% 80, 80, of our institutions uh, Non-profit organizations are uh, directly related to uh, religions. So the state can in no uh, means not be related with these institutions. But if Brazil is theoretically um, based on the liberty, oh, today we see some isolated um, episodes that, that are putting a label as if that was the largest, the widest expression of this lack of unity, which is a mistake. This is not right. I, I feel very, uh, very at easy to say it here. We do live in a violent uh, place. We have 55,000 people killed in the country every year. During the time that I'm addressing you, two people will be victims of violent crimes. So, yes, we are a violent people this day. And it's not from when it when it happens to an, a homosexual, for example. It's an act of discrimination. And the media wants to try to say that it, it originates from uh, uh, religious hate. And it's not. There's no way to find out where this, the violence comes from, where the 85, 95% of these crimes do not go to trial. So we're trying to expose and explain a fact that we don't even know uh, plainly and fully. Uh, summarizing really quickly here, some spheres in our power, the executive power, there's no public uh, instrument or tool to become to make this become a priority. They have other priorities like domestic violence and, and, and drug traffic. In the legislative, it's uh, it, there is a strong religious group, the evangelicals group, that they try to promote um, political parties with its aim to create a political, not a political or an economical discussion, but more of a political power of these evangelical groups. And the media, the media really exploits this in a, in a great way, uh, in, 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 a, in big measure, I mean. The judicial system also uh, legit has, uh, I'm sorry. The judicial system uh, is omits itself in some situations, and and when they when they try to voice their opinion, they also get uh, bashed by the media. Um, 
in 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 the academia there is no no presence and no action it's totally contrary to what we are discussing in this in this symposium it's not uh it's a very hostile ground for this debate and many other actors in the religious environment again i'm not my, don't take my words as the represent, representative, but my own opinion. Some churches do have a very myop role in this process. I'm not talking about the churches, which origin is, uh, it's not a well-traced origin. Uh, there is a fact that some of them are established for money laundering and, and drug trafficking. Now I'm talking about serious churches that sometimes cannot reach the opportunity that they want to have to perform in the public environment. That's why sometimes beating the Catholic Church is good because it uh, uh, weakens the, comp the competition. That is a mistake. In many instances where we see um, like a treaty in Brazil that was to totally attacked on groundless basis, um, the hostile manifestation of, from some searches in regards to other denominations in, in the public schools, we see that the in other words, the society allowed other religions to manifest themselves in in the public schools, but not the Catholic Church. So we see we see a bias there. So I do apologize for uh, going over my time, but I do appreciate the time that was given to me, and I'm at your disposal for to share some of the experiences that I have uh, lived and experienced. Thank you very much. We like to thank Dr. Hugo José Oliveira, who is an attorney of uh, the Confederation of the Bishops, and Odessi Brigol will be our next speaker. He is the representative of uh, J. Ruben Clark Society in Curitiba and member of the Liberty Commission of OAB in the city of Curitiba. Good morning. I would like to uh, thank the opportunity to be in the presence of, uh, of thinkers and people who are very smart. Uh, yesterday, at, uh, we opened this symposium. It has the theme as religion and our religion, law, and so social stability. Uh, Dr. Durham spoke about three thing, three plans that can influence life in society. The necessity to practice the social acts that are positive. That religion may collaborate with each other to promote social peace. And this collaboration needs to be pointed to one God respecting uh, the other creeds, that we need to have an intersection between law, peace, and liberty. Within those concepts, which is the object, of, of the, the main objective of this symposium, I'd like to share with you some examples of uh, positive social acts they are being promoted in Brazil, not only by the uh, the Society of Liber Re Religion Liberty of the uh, Obe of Paraná, the Association uh, and the Commission of uh, Liberty. Those are organizations that work uh, to um, promote law and order. The association is an organization in Brazil that studies the relationship between uh, this and global growth 
and liberty and try to find uh, try to find a positive space in the corp in corp corporative space uh, together with the BYU University this one of the three factors that helps with the gro global growth this study observed that uh, the organization in, or religious institution could uh, could um, stop the the economy and uh, involvement of other enterprises uh, to the country. Young uh, uh, entrepreneur, they they don't have uh, the desire to implement their resources and. And many times they bring barriers to stop the developing growth of a country. On the other, on the other hand, countries with a small uh, liberty, religious liberties uh, brings a, a better uh, a better investment in the country. This studies tells that companies have a better competitive uh, advantages to help others but also their clients and and vendors who can um, be positive in this area the association for religious liberty trying to promote it within the entrepreneurship and the interfaith dialogue has conceived two projects that we consider they have some of the common principles of the social stability. They are the theme of our seminar. First, uh, with the objective to draw attention to the importance of freedom uh, of religions have to Brazil has a, a natural vocation to the peaceful um, association with others. In a moment where intolerance increases in the world, this association uh, has promoted an event called the first celebration of religious freedom, Brazil, a voice to the world. And this event gathered 600 people and it was uh, performed in a mosque in, in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And united um, companies that wanted to promote the dialogue within the many different faiths and establish Brazil as one of the most tolerant countries in the world for uh, different faiths. We've had Adventists, Mormons, and Evangelicals, Jews, and, and repre repre representatives from many other religions. I have here some records of this event. And if we could, um, this the table uh, seen on this event that unites Jews and Catholics and Mormons and and uh, Muslims. It was a beautiful celebration that really stimulated the debate in Brazil and, and countries with a lot of uh, restrictions to religious freedom. We also had the opportunity uh, to hear from one of the apostles of the Mormon Church, who was actually uh, uh, open the seminary and many other representatives, prestigious representatives. A second project that was developed by uh, according to the guidelines of the association, was to create instruments, social instruments, so that uh, the big corporations, large or medium or small corporations in Brazil, may include in their uh, bylaws clauses that refer to freedom of religion and stimulating and encouraging the practice the, the practice of such a freedom in in the in the healthy cooperative environment and at their request uh, many North American um, entrepreneurs uh, spent their time elaborating documents 
attorneys that elaborate in uh, uh, statutes depending on the nature, noticing that, uh, that the, the company ad uh, adopts the practice of non-discrimination to religions. And this was directed to the HR departments, a manual of uh, co cooperative um, compromise and uh, creating the language for the bylaws that the company, the corporation respects the, the religions or the, the religious orientation of all the employees and prohibits any discrimination or retaliation based on religion. Regardless of belief, the corporation recognizes the social benefits of um, freedom of religion. These instruments are being analyzed and by a, a juridical commission, and soon it shall be um, launched a, a, a program to um, spread the awareness of these statutes and, and guidelines. Another project that has been developed through the the. Uh, attorney's organization in Brazil. The, it has been uh, organized a cycle of uh, addresses and seminars that were addressed to the many religious uh, denominations. And these speeches were um, formed and organized in such a way that in a synagogue, it was addressed by a Mormon in in the in, in the cathedral was uh, was a, another another religion and and so on and so forth so these events had a, a great support from the many different denominations that were encouraged to give uh, a more far reaching uh, view uh, that to to address and to approach uh, the religious freedom so these have been the experiences in Brazil that I'd like to share with you today. And we hope that uh, we may be inspired to go deeper into this debate on freedom of religion. Thank you very much. Nós agradecemos a bela exposição do Dr. Odassi Privol. We now have the opportunity to listen from Dr. Jonas, and he is the director of Ana Jude for, uh, for topics related to refugees. And after his address, we will have a session for questions and answers. Como eu localizo aqui? Deixa eu ver. Deixa eu ver se vai carregar agora. A apresentação. Tem a apresentação, tá, Tachão? Tem uma apresentação? Já está com vizinho. Good morning. I'd like to thank the opportunity to, for the invitation that was given me. As you can see by the theme, I brought some slides um, for a presentation that we did to the Latin American panel. So I ask what Jonas Moreno came from the northeast of Brazil in an event about, about uh, freedom of religion, talking about refugees. 
I work in Najuri, it's association uh, uh, law that talks about the liberty of fr freedom of religion. I organize a book and help organize a book. And I participate in the commission of uh, the law and some uh, research uh, companies in this area and the liberty of freedom of religion. But it was important for some of my colleagues to speak before me because I need to talk not only, spe not specifically, uh, specifically about this, but when we talk about refugees, we start to give examples of those who are persecuted normally because of lack of tolerance, religious tolerance in countries where there's no, no such uh, lib uh, freedom. This international, international laws does not uh, protect some of them. Um, and because of political, racial, and, and also social problems. I would love to give you some data just to give an idea. This map, it's a map that everybody knows. It shows the percentage of uh, m people moving from one place, from one place to another. It could be political, social, religious, racial, it doesn't matter. And we can see in this map is this a, 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 a people are moving from one place to another. 1993, we have about uh, changing in Africa, Europe, and Asia. About 50 million people was de um, was moved from one place to another because of of persecution, some kind. And as we talk about this, not only because of religion, of any other uh, reason, we can observe that in countries where there's no uh, tolerance, biggest part of, of, the, of the persecution is about is because of religion. Some of them is economical or social. But religious is one of the largest reasons why. So I'd like to talk about our international uh, jurisdiction system because in Brazil, because we have this freedom of religion, uh, liberty of expression, and I agree plainly with what Dr. Ugo said, we have a fight in everything, and everything is because of religion. The, the, the reason of we have issue, people say that religion is something from the devil. Um, and we know that that's not the true. But that's motivating me, this uh, international jurisdiction system um, and all kinds of persecutions. Of course, it is true because of the two world wars, millions of people were affected. And um, it came, uh, it was necessary to discipline what the destiny of the people, people who lost everything. They could not come back to their land of origin because nothing was there. So what was the action? What the world should do so these people could be received and, and receive a new home? And uh, many people were dislocated with, because, with no guilty at all just because of reason, of, of war. This proportion became so big that changed the, the human rights. Those rights were defended for, for some people, but, but they didn't have a perspective, a specific perspective, and they were also uh, receive uh, the... the what happened with them. And this was not talk. The international uh, passed to Vera now to help me here. And they had, they started having the concern for the the refugees uh, treated or seen as an asylum from the perspective of an asylum. And in, 
And when this term was defined, it was very important because it was considered an apolitical, not politicized institution, so that there could be no uh, diplomacy wearing out. I mean, no. Uh, it was based on the principle on, on the of human rights, and this international convention was supposed to be uh, done through international treaties and. Uh, through internal norms and guidelines, how the ref the rights of the refugees would work, and therefore that gave cause to the first declaration. We're not going to talk a lot about a lot about uh, human rights here, but in 1948, the the declaration of the the human rights was for the first time defined. Uh, the person who is a victim and victimized from persecution. But after, after this perspective was generated because of the great two wars, there was the uh, desire and the need to work with the people who would be quali juridically quali judicially qualified. So that we had to create protocols that brought discipline to the and, and created legislation how to treat the foreigners in Brazil, for example. And in 1950, the, uh, the United Nations was created with some objectives. Number one, protect all men and women and children, uh, any kinds of refugees for any kind of persecution. And in Brazil, at that time, we were already seeing this uh, religious persecution not only to send food, but also to create a solution that would, that could help these people to reclaim their human dignity. And in 1951, um, the United Nations uh, already, uh, again, established uh, uh, the statute of the refugees. And from that point on, we coined a technical term for the refugees that should be applied uh, free of discrimination based on uh, race or religion or, or sex and establish some basic clauses. For example, the definition of the term refugee um, sometimes these refu refugees whatever the persecution was, political, racial, or what, or religious, it establishes that the necessity to give documentation to properly, so when a refugee arrives in Brazil, it receives a new status from the National Council of Refugees, and it, the person receives a Brazilian passport and receives uh, a card, like a social a social security card, to have access to the social services available. So the important key here is the events uh, occurred before 1951. What would have? What will we do with the cases that came afterwards? In in the statute, of, I will briefly mention. Right after, what to do with the events that happened after 1951 that amplified the term of refugee for um, occurrences that were not uh, predicted or were not uh, um, approached by the statutes created before. It's very interesting, this protocol it's seen in 141 countries that have adopted this uh, refugee as, uh, statute. And what I'd like to bring up here is that the, the, the United Nations was supposed to promote in each different country the this legislation uh, in a domestic way so that all of them could not only adopt it, the, adopt the, the guidelines, and, but also to practice in their own country uh, that has adopted the guidelines. But then something interesting came up. 
uh, it would only first it would only cover the, those cases based on religion or discrimination or political. But after 1980, it has uh, we have seen a, a real big necessity uh, to create this for the countries that have uh, civil um, mayhem and in conflicts. So the reach of the um, statute has been amplified so that we could also receive uh, those who come from um, persecutions not based on religion or uh, politics, but uh, from social um, social conflict and, and war, a war. So, so after this declaration of Cartagena, also people who have been uh, persecuted or going through uh, social instability. So what I'd like to bring up is the Brazilian example here. Brazil has some very basic principles in its federal constitution that we have already mentioned here, especially that has been adopted in the language of the human rights uh, what has, that has to do with the dignity of the human individual. And in Brazil, on a side comment, in our constitution from 1946, before the, the United Nations, we talked about the liberty of conscience, which seemed to be something really, really already developed. So Brazil, in spite of all its difficulties, it, had, it was already ahead of other nations in that regard. We have some uh, features here that uh, are like guidelines for the Brazilian uh, statutes. And Brazil in 1996 also created the National Program for the Human Rights. So we had, but you're gonna ask if we adopted in 1996 what was created in 1960, but well, we were the first to protect the human rights in Latin America. It was the third in the world and the first in, the, in uh, Latin America. With, with the, ob uh, the objectives in, in the short and long uh, term to take care of the refugees based on uh, grounds of uh, social, political, or religious persecution. I just like to bring up our Brazilian experiences here. In 1997, Brazil established another statute um, uh, in regards to the refugees, and we created the National Council of the Refugees, and Brazil officially started treating and uh, cooperating with the other nations. In Brazil, it's, it's very important to notice that we work and we have to work with the, the freedom, uh, religious freedom fronts and humanitarian fronts so that Brazil may be an example in this search. If we have a country where uh, religious freedom is affected, it's easier to act to receive these uh, individuals who are persecuted for all the reasons expounded. I would like to briefly mention uh, some language that I was invited to make a comment on a book uh, recently. It's being launched right now and it talks about the refugees and because there's a, a fear uh, to uh, receive the refugees based on religion, on uh, racial differences. And as a Christian that I am, I like to um, mentioned two examples where the theologists, American theologists, and another Britain, uh, British theologist talks about that where a country, where the country has the liberty to uh, um, take over this, this uh, effort, embrace this effort. In, in Matthew, we read that blessed are those who are merciful because they will have mercy. And a lot of people that maybe they profess being religious, but sometimes they are under a very radical extreme practice. And these theologians, theologians said this, 
that those who are merciful will be blessed. It's not about, it's not those about uh, who were um, defeated by misfortune, like the, the traveler, the good Samaritan that showed mercy, or those who think of those rejected by society, the outcast, and those who are cause some evil to us. So justice claims for justice, but mercy claims for forgiveness. Our God is a forgiven and merciful one and show us continuously that the citizens of his king should also extend mercy. And the second uh, statement I'd like to make from this British theologian, the merciful are those aware who are uh, unworthy of receiving God's mercy. And and if it was not for God's mercy, they would be only sinners, and all, not only sinners, but condemned sinners. And they are, so therefore, they are open to consider uh, towards others the same mercy that God is considered towards them. And knowing that the mercy that is extended to them should be extended to others as well. Thank you very much for for this presentation. I'm sorry it was long, but I tried to summarize as much as I could. And But I'm very thankful for the attention, and I'm sorry to be concentrating on this theme, but it's a passion for me. And I'm very happy. I was very happy on the first day that we talked about the religious persecution. Regardless of the country, the persecution was from a different group. It was always so i thankful for the opportunity. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'd like to thank all of those who participated for the themes that they spoke to us. We have a few minutes for questions and answer. I'd like to ask a question to to Deputy, Federal Deputy Moroni Torgan. So, as we got together to start this parliamental front, you use the phrase, what unites us, it's bigger than what separates us. Could you please, um, how this vision as we got together, would help uh, the civil society in this uh, in this matter. Thanks for the question, and at the same time, by the same token, I'd like to uh, celebrate with all of you for the, uh, the dresses and for the opportunity given to us by Brigham Young University. And in reality, Brazilian people has. Uh, peaceful, it's, it's peaceful by nature, and, and it's God-fearing by nature. So we have a lot more qualifications that unite us than divide us. Now they're trying to put in a leftist theory, uh, in other words, to separate the classes and make this um, uh, partisan and, and create this, this conflict and get the majority that is normally the the the, the poorest uh, part, but not to trying to get them out of poverty so that they become and stay dependable, dependent on the state. So this is a Marxist theory that creates um, a, a de dependence uh, to the state, and the minorities, to my surprise, sometimes are supported by the left. But in 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 general, the left destroys, annihilates uh, the, the minorities. We see that in Cuba, some, many times, in, in like the Cuban government, if it's uh, a user, a traffic user, they, uh, they kill them. S same thing in China and in other countries. So, actually, left, in practical terms, does not give any support to the minorities. It actually, uh, try to eliminate the, the the minorities in practical terms it's become it becomes totalitarian and this total totalitarianism um, 
goes against the minorities. So the minorities have to be subject to the state or they will suffer the consequences. So this, this pattern seen, this model seen from the left is inconsequent and Brazil is going through this moment right now. It's the moment where the, theor the democratic theory is still prevalent, thank goodness, and the left is not being able to sustain itself because the left is sustained on totalitarianism. And without this totalitarian um, system, the l with the democracy, the left starts to arise more and more so that they can to avoid losing power. So those progressive, all the progressive come from the theories developed in the countries that were developed in the countries that were set as progressive and they actually achieved the development after they attained themselves to the tradition and conservative approaches and theories. So I consider progressive uh, defending the family, defending the institutions, defending liberties, defending democracy. To me, that's being progressive. And if uh, to, cons to maintain this defense is necessary, that's progressive. Everything else will only demonstrate a uh, retrocession in so of society, uh, 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 a, a state without family, a, start, a state with uh, unfair competition, uh, to treat everybody uh, unequal rights is, is, is just uh, imp impossible. This was the frustration of the leftist movement. So in Brazil, we have much more that unite us, and these are the theories that, for me, are antagonic to uh, the Brazilian people's nature. They will see, they will self-destruct. Dr. Hugo. Dr. Dr. Hugo. Uh, congratulations for your explanation. You mentioned that, uh, re-emphasizing, uh, that, that was your personal opinion, that because of Congr evangelicals and, and, and they become part of the politics of Brazil, and I agree, we create a stereotype vision because of the media and society about uh, freedom of religion. In your opinion, your personal opinion, how do you understand will be the best way to obtain a participation a direct uh, of the CNBB on the parliamental front about the freedom of religion who is presided by uh, Deputy uh, Torgan? that there is this evangelical view of Brazil, evangelicals are doing this and that, they are conservatives, but they are not, and so on and so forth. How can we see this, uh, including the Catholic Church, how can we see uh, a solution for this? I made it a, a point to say that it was my opinion because I knew I was going to say some sentences that would create some, some. Um, it, it would be very hard to uh, approach to certain themes here and, and 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 gain a reputation or being labeled. And, and when I alluded to this this uh, party of evangelical parties, I'm really alluding to what we see in media every day. Uh, the manifestations of the de this or that uh, parliament that uses the pulpit to defend ideas that we, d we cannot defend uh, ourselves. Um, and in that regard of participation, w I remember there is an organization called in Brazil, there is an organization of all the Christian churches in Brazil. I also participate as a, a juridical party there. 
and they gather all the churches, uh, Protestant churches, the Catholic Church, and that is part of uh, many other forums. I'll, I really uh, emphasize here that when I mention about the churches, they are, are the shoot from the hip when they attacked the Catholic Association. I really want to emphasize the uh, posture of Anajou, which was uh, opposite, totally opposite. And wanted to defend the right of all religions because this is the, the view from a, a good perspective. To defend the interests of the Catholics is to defend the interests of the Mormons, of the Muslims, of the Jews, of, uh, of any other, the Buddhists, any other. And then, so when I'm asked, to, how can the Catholic Association of Catholic uh, Churches in Brazil participate? I, number one, I know the initiative, the idea of the Parliament Front. Number two, in all honesty, I haven't had the opportunity to participate in that first meeting because I had conflicting, uh, conflicting uh, schedule. So I could not participate fully in those perspectives, but I know that the CNBB is part of many of these organizations with themes. They are very close to this freedom of religion, and I don't see any problems to participate. But also it depends on um, a, a decision from the, the, the board of the rest of the presidency of the uh, Catholic Org uh, Association. He's talking about this this representative who could be. He's now in Rome, but as soon as he comes back to Brazil, we would need his uh, his uh, approval to participate. For example, we have the Commission for the Family in São Paulo, and uh, Father Rafael. He's all the time in the National Congress trying to follow these uh, projects of interest on in the family. We have other commissions uh, on topics that are totally related um, in the, uh, on the interfaith dialogue. And I don't see in, by no means no any reason to see uh, um, an opposition not to participate. And the, I honestly, I I don't I don't like the idea of having a Catholic uh, party or an evangelical party. We I don't want to spend my time here saying explaining the whys, but I don't like the format because I think it's richer. It's a to have a front, a parliamentary front uh, around a value than based on a personal flag or a personal interest. Or in other words, it will become divisive. It will become divisive. So that's why. And that's it. Thank you. Nós estamos nos aproximando we are coming to a conclusion of our uh, meeting. We have uh, time for one more, one more uh, question. Remember, we we want we, we want to go eat. <laughs> this question goes to Dr. Pegol, but anybody can ask, answer. The 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 uh, freedom of religion is good for business. So why? The, uh, the business community of Brazil that don't want to be part in this, in, this, in this movement. I say this because I was with Brian Green uh, and I saw his efforts to talk and convince them that it's, it's, it's clear what are the motivations behind that people are so timid of the the business community in Brazil to defend and to promote a freedom of religion. They're not against, but we don't see them active in in, in promote these values. Uh, very interesting your question, but it's 
it's a cultural issue, I would say, the involvement of the corporate community, of the business community in this discussion. We are here discussing uh, based on uh, advancements uh, made from the religious uh, associations. So it's a seed that has been planted by the association. Um, of freedom religion in Brazil and all the idea, all the projects, uh, it, it, it requires maturation, it requires development and good practices and good results and seeing the good results. There is a project percolating now uh, trying to link the uh, Olymp Olympics that will be uh, performed in Brazil to offer um, awards to the companies that adopt this philosophy. So it's small incentives, small pro um, examples that uh, should be encouraging so that we can achieve maturity and in the future make these practices more consistent and more visible in the uh, in the cooperative uh, in the corporate world with the question that Mario did I would like to express that there are initi important initiatives involving uh, the business world I would like to brother Carlos Martins is a, a entrepreneur in Brazil and be a big support in the um, religious cause in the co corporative world. On the 28th, we were together uh, to open one of his business together with Ronaldo. Um, and we start a, a franchise um, twist, and he invited us to open the channels in, the, uh, in Rio where we could give this award in in uh, during the Olympics of 2016 uh, helping uh, and, and uh, ignoring uh, the companies the private sector who is um, who are involved in this in this field together with the Parliament of front is helping us in a lot of this in incentive like to thank all the all of those who participate for sure we could stay here for a long time debating this important themes and i'll invite each one of you to give a, a, a hand to uh, all of those who participated thank you very much